Okay, everyone, what are we trying to get started? It's 11 o'clock and I think we've only got the room for half an hour. So uh, let's, try, let's try to get started. Welcome, firstly, to, to Melbourne Open Day. Thanks for coming out on such a, a miserable Melbourne winter's day. Hopefully everyone's in the right place. So um, I'm Marco Gisalberti. I'm a senior lecturer in the Environmental Hydrology and Water Resources Group, just called the Water Group informally at the University of Melbourne. Um, and so I'm here to talk about, basically, here some information about environmental engineering degrees at the University of Melbourne. Hopefully everyone's in the right place for that. I'll try to talk for maybe 15 or 20 minutes and then if you've got any questions, it's probably valuable to have a bit of a Q&A session before we get kicked out. Um, so just to give you an idea about why uh, we would recommend coming to the University of Melbourne to study engineering, based on university rankings, we, the QS rankings, we are the number one uh, engineering school in Australia and rank 27, 27th in the world. Uh, so we have a very strong reputation and those rankings are based on uh, research performance of the staff as well as uh, graduate employability, student satisfaction, all those sorts of things. Uh, what's really important, I think, about the Melbourne engineering degrees is that they are recognised globally. So we're accredited not only, not only for Engineers Australia and therefore the Washington Accord, uh, but also Europe's. So maybe parents don't necessarily want to hear this, but what that means is when the children graduate, they can go practice in Europe if they want to because we are Europe's accredited. So because engineering in Melbourne is a master's degree, much like it is for the majority of Europe, you're a you're a fully accredited engineer once you graduate um, in many parts of the world. So the question is often asked, why come to Melbourne for engineering? You can do a four-year degree somewhere else, why would you want to do a five-year degree here? Now, I think there's a variety of reasons that I would recommend this. Um, firstly, you are going to be taught by world leaders in their particular research fields. So in environmental engineering, that's people involved in water, who are involved in looking at climate change, people involved in looking at waste management, all those fields. You've been taught by the, the leading researchers in the field. And all of our degrees have a really strong industry-facing aspect to them. So you won't take a subject in an environmental engineering degree here that doesn't have industry lecturers, uh, industry projects, um, and a whole range of, uh, of industry involvement, whether that's site visits, guest lecturers, there's a range of industry involvement in pretty much every subject that we take. Um, you could also have an industry placement for credit. So if you want to take an internship, you can get two subjects worth of credit for taking that internship in an environmental engineering company. So a lot of students do that in their summers, uh, do some good vacation work. So as I said, we do have that international accreditation through URACE. Uh, and one of the real benefits, I think, of having engineering as a master's degree is the flexibility that that creates. So certainly when I was in year 12, I had no idea what I wanted to do and kind of fell into my particular pathway more by randomness than design. Um, but you can, through taking your three-year bachelor's degree, get a feel for all the engineering disciplines and then make a more informed choice about which master's degree you want to pursue. So just make sure everyone's on the same page. Engineering at Melbourne is a master's level degree, which means you do a, an undergraduate degree before engineering, often a Bachelor of Science, but it can be a Bachelor of Design, a Bachelor of Commerce. And after that, you get entry into the master's program and you have your choice of civil, mechanical, environmental, electrical engineering. But making that choice three years into your academic career, rather than straight out of high school, allows you I think, to make a much more informed choice about where your interests lie. So the question that I'm often asked and have been asked already today by many people is what is environmental engineering? And that's a perfectly logical question because the more traditional disciplines like civil and mechanical have a much more well-established reputation and a brand about them. So environmental engineering is really about understanding the interaction between complex environmental systems and human or engineered systems. And to understand that interaction, you have to have a really strong understanding about environmental processes whether that's in the atmosphere, in rivers, in lakes, in oceans. You need to understand the physics, the chemistry, and the biology of processes in those environmental systems. And so basically what we're about as environmental engineers is designing and building sustainable solutions to environmental problems. And that covers a range of sectors. So one of them obviously might be to look at the impact of climate change. Uh, so my area of research is really part of it, is looking at coral reefs, and how they can be sustained. Now, climate change plays a huge role in that because, of course, as we know, the Great Barrier Reef is ex experiencing extreme bleaching because of the, the warmer water. And so the question as environmental engineers is, can we 
future-proof the Great Barrier Reef? And if not, can we evaluate the efficiency of some engineering solutions? So the state of the Barrier Reef is so bad right now that they're actually thinking about covering the reef in a blanket of cold water. So think about the volume of water that you would need to pump out into the ocean to cover the Great Barrier Reef with cold water. That's the level that we're getting to. But then the question is, well, that's fine. That may help the reef regenerate in the short term, but to what extent does that water then get mixed away or get flushed away by the ocean? Currents? That's where environmental engineers come in. So we understand what's going on in the environment, the, 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 the forcings of waves and wind, and understand the processes that are going to affect the efficiency of that solution. Water scarcity, big issue in Australia as well. So any issue to do with freshwater quantity and quality is where environmental engineers come in. If you're thinking about the Murray-Darling Basin, and we're trying to think about how much water in the Murray-Darling should be used for irrigation, how much should be put back into the rivers for environmental flows and how much should be stored, they're all environmental engineering decisions that need to be made. So across all of these sectors, that's where environmental engineers come in. Renewable energy is a really hot field at the moment. A lot of our graduates move into renewable energy, whether that's wind farms, wave, wave boy farms, a tidal power. In, environmental engineers might not design the hardware, but environmental engineers tell you where to put your wave farm, where to put your wind farm for maximum power extraction, and also to withstand the kind of extreme events that those systems might be exposed to. So you've got a huge storm in Antarctica that's coming on a wave farm off the a wave wave farm off the south coast of Australia. Will it withstand it or will it fail? Yeah, the environmental engineering inputs into those sorts of decisions. So to give you an example of the kind of research that we do here. Um, and this obviously feeds into the subjects that you take because all the, all the teachers of the classes will be these researchers. We look at, for example, the generation of monster waves in the ocean. So I think you might have heard in the news the biggest wave ever recorded, 26, 28 metres, was just recorded off the coast of New Zealand. The question is, where are they generated? Why are they generated? And what happens when they hit a shore? That's an area of ongoing research in the department. Like I say, my area is looking at marine flows over coral reefs understanding the processes at play and then understanding how we manage these systems sustainably. Great Barrier Reef was valued at, I think, $60 billion. So we have this $60 billion resource that's being degraded year by year. How do we preserve it? Uh, turning any water into potable water. So water recycling is a, is a huge topic at the moment. How do we get the most out of our freshwater resources on a very, very dry continent? Can we embed these ideas of water recycling uh, into future-proofing our drinking water supply. And then lots of interesting projects. If you've been by the environmental engineering display already, you would have seen the drone there. So a lot of environmental engineers are using drone technology to study environmental processes. One of the more interesting ones, I think, is looking at vineyards. So if you fit the drones with infrared sensors to look at water, you can get an idea by flying the drone over the vineyard about where there are regions of water stress. So rather than just watering the entire vineyard all the time, you can target the areas that are experiencing water stress and then be most efficient with the use of irrigated water. So all this drone technology is incredibly valuable, valuable for remote sensing and then understanding how to deal with finite environmental resources. So that just gives you a flavour of what we do here from a research perspective that feeds into our, our degree offerings here at the university. So this is just a little bit more about environmental engineering, ensuring the sustainability of our resources, and it's really about designing solutions that are sustainable. So they consider the triple bottom line, all the solutions, all, all engineering solutions, their impact on not only the finances of the project, but also on society and the environment. And in order to, to figure out if you're interested in environmental engineering, we basically say if you're interested in Physics, maths, and environmental studies at this stage of your schooling, environmental engineering could be a really interesting career for you to pursue. A lot of people think for some reason that you don't need maths to be an environmental engineer, and I'd say that's absolutely not the right message to be sent. Because environmental engineering systems are very, very complex. And to understand and make sense of that complexity, you need to have the right mathematical treatment of the system. So a strong grounding in maths is really fundamental to environmental engineering. Um, as a field. Okay, so I, I, whether or not you've been told about this today, at the University of Melbourne, in terms of how you might try to study environmental engineering here, 
The university does offer these graduate degree packages now where you can apply for both your bachelor's degree and your engineering degree through VTAC straight away. Uh, and so this is open to students that have an ATAR of 96 and above. It doesn't mean that's the only way of getting in, but what this does, if you are a, a student with an ATAR in that range, it will guarantee you a Commonwealth supported place if you pass your undergraduate degree. So ordinarily, through standard entry, you have to obtain an average mark at the university of 65% in your bachelor's degree to get into the Master of Engineering program. But if you do take up one of these graduate degree packages, you apply for both up front, and you simply have to pass your bachelor's degree to get a CSP or Commonwealth supported place in a Master of Engineering program. <coughs> and these, these are the packages that we offer, combining our engineering degrees with bachelor's degrees in, for environmental engineering, let's say largely, the Bachelor of Science, but you're open to combine our master's degree with a Bachelor of Commerce, a Bachelor of Design, a Bachelor of Biomedicine to allow you to get entry into our master's program. And so it's by and large a three plus two system. So your, uh, your bachelor's degree takes you three years, your master's degree takes you two years if you've taken a few of the prerequisite subjects. If you haven't, it might be a semester or two longer, but it's usually a three plus two degree, so a five a five year degree, but you leave with a master's degree. That's really one of the, 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 the valuable things about a Melbourne engineering degree, is you leave with an accredited master's degree. And that can, our graduates find that that can open a lot of doors for them, whether they stay in engineering or not. So the, the graduate degree packages are open for students that have a 96 ATAR. If you don't, that doesn't mean that you can't study engineering, quite the opposite. Uh, it just means that you go through the standard entry uh, process and what that you enrol in a science, design, commerce degree in your bachelor's level. You have to achieve a weighted average mark of 65% across those three years and that will then guarantee you a place in a master's degree. Moving on. But the flexibility, I think, is, is so key. So in environmental engineering, not all of our students realise that they wanted to be environmental engineers. And certainly, my parents didn't pressure me to be an environmental engineer because they didn't know what it was. So you can take those three years of your bachelor's degree, figure out which stream of engineering you're interested in, and then apply for that master's degree at that point. So these are the details about the, the ATAR, uh, scores required for the bachelor's degree because that is your entry to the university. And so you can see you don't need 96. For something like science, you might be looking at about 85 on the ATAR. And then I won't go through, this is a lot of detail here, I'm not going to go through it, but you guys probably know much more than I do about this, about all the prereqs that are required to go into those bachelor's degrees. So just there is, there is obviously uh, quite a bit of uncertainty about what engineering at Melbourne looks like. Choose your undergraduate degree from a variety of uh, disciplines and a variety of majors. So we have our own environmental systems major within the Bachelor of Science, but you don't have to take that. That's just the major that we think leads best into environmental engineering master's degree. You take that master's degree and then you obviously exit to employment with professional accreditation. This, this is our study plan. I, I really don't want to go over this in detail. Uh, there's, there's at, at our environmental engineering booth, this is all up there, it's all in the booklets that you've been given on page 16. The, the exact subjects that you're going to be taking uh, if you take, if you enter a Master of Engineering Environmental is, is all given to you. This is really just to show that our subjects are divided into three categories. So we have our core subjects which are shown in grey, and they're the subjects that unfortunately you do have to take. Uh, there are the elective subjects in blue, so they're the subjects where you choose from a list of subjects. Uh, and then there are breadth subjects in the, in the bachelor's degree that you have to take outside the faculty of your bachelor's degree. So if you're doing a bachelor of science, your breadth subjects can't be science subjects. They can be commerce subjects, they can be fine art subjects, but they can't be science subjects. And that breadth makes you think outside your immediate interests and we think gives you a bit of flexibility and allows you to become a really well-rounded student moving into that Masters of Engineering program. So this is our, this is our major in the Bachelor of Science. This is how you enter uh, the University of Melbourne. You take this for three years and then of course you've got all your core engineering skills up there. So the maths, the mechanics, uh, fluid mechanics, uh, analyzing uh, systems in the context of biological processes, and then you move into the Master of Engineering Environmental, which is effectively a two-year program. 
uh, where the first year is really designed to give you all the core environmental engineering skills that we think you need. And then the final year is really a lab. You can, the students can dictate the flavour of their final year. There's five electives. And so we, can, we package those electives to the students in sensible combinations. You choose those electives from a list, list of about 22 subjects. And so if a student is interested in moving into the renewable energy sector, we package a set of five electives together to say, well, we think this combination of subjects is going to give you a comparative advantage moving into that sector. And so whatever, whatever sector you're interested in moving into, there are sensible combinations of elective subjects that will allow you to be a really, uh, a really strong contender for positions that might, uh, might open up in that sector. And so we combine those electives with a research project across two semesters in the final year where students get a chance to really get at the forefront of environmental engineering research and they conceptualise, design, implement uh, research throughout those two semesters. So there's a few interesting aspects of environmental engineering. We think it's a very hands-on degree. So I've spoken to a few people today already about this. You can learn a bit about environmental engineering in the office or the lab, but you can more, learn an awful lot more in the environment. And so, for example, in the monitoring environmental impacts subject, we have a week-long field camp. So students uh, go to a river catchment in Victoria, and they design and then implement and then use a monitoring program to understand the processes that are going on in that river and the impact of land use and anthropogenic uh, influences on that system. And that's all student-led. So it's a week-long camp uh, getting out to a real environmental system to understand what's going on. We also have an elective called International uh, River Basin Management that's joint with uh, Tsinghua University in China. So there is cohorts from two universities and we have a field trip. One year it's in China, one year it's in Australia, alternating to look at particular aspects of river basin management. So the more we get our students out in the field through site visits, field camps, field studies, the better we think they are equipped as environmental engineers. We're going on time. We've got a few minutes. Uh, so, in terms of employability, uh, the numbers are really, really strong for our graduates. I can't quite remember the exact number. It's something like 95% of our students uh, have full-time employment within a few months of graduation. And environmental engineering is continuing to grow as a demand area. I'd say even, even 15 or 20 years ago, there wasn't as much of a demand for environmental engineers because it was always felt like you could upskill, if you like, another engineer to take the role of an environmental engineer in a big engineering company. And I'd say that thinking has, has been gradually eroded over the last 10, 15 years so that now people realise that you need a student with a degree in environmental engineering. And the Melbourne, the Melbourne brand of environmental engineering uh, has allowed really strong employability for a lot of our students. Uh, so the job prospects for environmental engineers are excellent. Um, I'll talk about maybe some of the pathways that students go to once they graduate. Uh, but basically, this is just to reiterate that we have a really strong industry-facing component of this degree. So you can, through taking about 12 to 14 weeks of professional work experience, get credit for that internship. There's a range of industry projects that you can choose from throughout a, throughout a range of subjects. And, even that research project that you work on at the end can be done and is often done in combination with industry. Uh, and the Environmental Engineers Student Society is really, really strong. So they're an excellent student club. Uh, they have industry nights where they invite a bunch of, uh, bunch of practicing environmental engineers to a room like we were dealing with uh, over, in, over in the old engineering building just so that the students can interact with, with the engineers and understand what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, the kinds of projects that they work on, and their career prospects moving forward. And we also have things like the Endeavour Exhibition, which is our showcase for the research projects. So students showcase their research to government, to industry, and to academics uh, to show what they've been working on. And again, all that collaboration between uh, the academic, between the students and industry, enhances the students' job prospects moving forward. So I've probably covered this a little bit, but those employment outcomes are really, really strong. Uh, through another ranking scheme, the, uh, the university's ranked number seven worldwide for employability um, for our engineering graduates. And there are a lot of schemes at the university that really do encourage not only employability, but startups and entrepreneurships. So we have the Melbourne Accelerator Program that is really just a startup accelerator for our students if they have, a, if they have a great idea and want to hit the ground running. 
We have, as well as our Master of Engineering degrees, we have Engineering plus Business Streams. Now, unfortunately, Environmental Engineering doesn't have that combination. Uh, but other streams do, where a lot of those elective subjects are taken up with business and management subjects. So if you want to understand, understand the business side of engineering more, it's a great combination for a lot of these streams. So in terms of, in terms of where you might go with an environmental engineering degree, it's such a diverse set of pathways that it's really hard to sort of condense that to a singular experience. So our students might go to work in the, in the public sector after they graduate, whether that's for state government departments like DELP, Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, or the Bureau of Meteorology, for example. Uh, they might go into the private sector, so even things like Engineers Without Borders uh, is a pretty common uh, pathway for our students. It's not something you maybe have necessarily heard of, but it's the engineering equivalent of Doctors Without Borders, uh, basically probably going to engineering work. Um, but then a lot of students might go to work for consulting firms of various sizes. Uh, now there's a lot around Melbourne, Water Tech, we can talk about in more detail, uh, Golder, Alluvium. And then they might go to work for large engineering companies. So these large engineering companies now have really significant in house environmental engineering groups. So whether that's Woodside, BHP, Carnegie, Clean Energy, these big, big engineering companies are increasingly employing our graduates. And they work across that range of sectors uh, that you can see there. And you know, throughout the degree, we encourage students to think about which sector they might want to move into. And like I say, we package those electives to help those students out. So if there are queries about, about fees and funding and scholarships, I'm happy to, happy to address them, although there are several booths around today that will help you out, perhaps more than I can. Um, but suffice it to say that the university does offer a really comprehensive range of scholarships for students. There are Commonwealth supported placements, so they're highly government subsidised positions. Um, there are also Australian fee places where the students pay the full cost of tuition. But that Commonwealth supported place, if you come through the Melbourne pathway, if you achieve the requisite mark in your undergrad degree, you have a guaranteed Commonwealth supported place in the master's degree. And that's where you pay the minimum amount of tuition. But if you're interested at all in the scholarships that are available, there's a lot of information out there today that will help you out with the opportunities that you have. 